All right, so hi everybody. My name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of Universe Today, and welcome to our weekly space hangout for January 26, 2012. Once again, I've gathered together some of the finest minds in space and astronomy, science, journalism, and who joined me here on the interwebs to discuss uh, the big stories that broke this week. So who have I got to this week? I've got, and again, uh, the, the order that I see them is completely different from the order that, uh, that you see them. So people will need to, uh, to wave so that we remember who they are. So we've got Alan Boyle from MSNBC's Cosmic Log. We've got uh, <laughs> Ian O'Neill <laughs> from uh, the Discovery.com Space News. Did I get that right? Yeah. Uh, Nicole Gallucci, the noisy astronomer, also a contributor at Discovery Space News. We've got Dr. Pamela Gay, Star Strider, my co-host at Astronomy Cast, and why is it always you last, Phil? Dr. Phil Plate, the bad astronomer. You there, Phil? Nobody puts the bad astronomer in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> but we do put you at the end of the row. So that is odd, isn't it? <laughs> I, I think it maybe it was when you joined. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's always like it's always the same order. I think it is I always yeah. It do. is always the same order. Maybe when you joined Google Plus in reverse order. I'm not sure. Uh, it, it's an order of our first names alphabetically. Aha, ah, thank you. I was just working on the last name there, but okay. There it is. All right. So this week we're going to talk about the uh, the intense solar storms that have been coming our way. We're going to talk about Newt Gingrich's plans for a moon base by 2020. Uh, we're going to talk about the discovery that, in fact, it probably wasn't arsenic life in that lake. Uh, we're going to talk about how black holes uh, may or may not lead to galaxy formation. And we're going to follow up, probably for the last time, on the Phobos Prime mission. But before we wanted to do that, it's sort of a sad and somber occasion, which is the, it's one of the remembrance, it's the remembrance week from NASA, where we look back and, uh, and remember the loss of Apollo 1, the Space Shuttle Challenger, and the Space Shuttle Columbia, all of which were lost sort of during this time over various years. So, Nicole, you had some information on that. <coughs> yeah, today is um, the, I think it's the 45th anniversary of the Apollo 1 disaster. Um, so they've christened this the Day of Remembrance for all the, the men and women that we've lost uh, in the astronaut program. Um, and in 1986, we had the challenge loss of the Challenger shuttle um, on the 28th. And February 1st, um, there was some joking before we started recording about whether I was alive for or remember any of these things. Um, and the Columbia disaster um, was uh, it was February 1st uh, when I was in college, um, and and I got this frantic call from my mom that day saying, "Don't go into space! Don't go into space!" because um, she knew how much I wanted to be an astronaut, um, and so that, that, that hit pretty hard. We were all uh, sitting around the lunch table at college, um, just mourning that loss, um, seeing such a, a disaster happen after such a successful mission. Um, so, uh, so this is the week that we remember and honor the sacrifice that the astronauts have made. Um, so what, what kinds of things is NASA going to be doing this week? Usually uh, what they do is that the administrator, Charles Bolden, will go to Arlington and, and uh, lay a wreath at uh, the memorials. There's a Challenger Memorial and a Columbia Memorial at, at Arlington, and so that, that's part of it. And, and the administrator also generally makes some comments. I think he already has a, a video um, up uh, remembering the, the sacrifice that was made. Uh, I. I was around <laughs> for uh, Challenger. In fact, I was in the newsroom at the Seattle PI. At the time, I was one of the features editors, and so uh, I was a little bit bugged because everybody was going over to the TV in the managing editor's office and, uh, and watching something. I didn't know what it was, and so I, I thought, these people should be getting back to work. But uh, uh, it turned out to be a very tragic day. And for Columbia, I was here at MSNBC. I was working at MSNBC, but I was actually sleeping in. It was a Saturday. Yeah. It, was a, mm -hmm. it was a mission that was a science mission, not that big of a deal. I felt, okay, I'm yeah. going to let the news desk take care of this one. And so I got the call to come in, and it and, uh, turned out to be a 20-hour day that day. And a, a lot of people you know, spent a lot of tears and, and a lot of work trying to cope with, with that particular tragedy. And yeah, we're still, still feeling the effects of that. 
it, it was a hard news day. I, I was working at Astronomy Magazine at the time, and I remember I was on my way driving out to the barn where I kept my horse, and I got a phone call from a frantic amateur astronomer in Texas who actually knew several of the astronauts and had very recently gone camping with several of them. And she was just completely broken up. And it was, the, the astronomy is very good about not trying to work at staff beyond the work day. And I remember, OK, who do I call to get into the building on a Saturday? How do I get a hold of James Oberg to get him to write us a story to throw on the web immediately? And then trying to cope with the fact that this happened over Texas, where I'd gone to grad school. We, we all have so many personal connections, because our field is so small that we all knew people who were directly impacted. And I, I suspect Phil Fraser and I all have memories of, of, just like Nicole, how we were impacted. For us, it was the, the Challenger disaster. I was in the sixth grade, and it happened during the lunch hour. And, I remember coming back, and I grew up in Massachusetts. All my teachers knew Krista McCulloch. It, New England is small. And uh, my, my algebra teacher had been one of the finalists for the astronaut in space. And the difference, I think, was it was her way of putting it was we choose to take these risks. We choose to put our lives in danger for the name of exploration. And it was this fabulous message to get in the sixth grade of, it's all right to take risks if it's something you believe in that will advance understanding, because that's what you have to do, or we'll never accomplish our dreams. Yeah. It, it was sad, but it was a great teachable moment with a very broken up algebra teacher. And so I know that NASA's going to have lots of information on this, and there'll be lots of, of ceremonies and, and articles. So definitely, you know, this is a chance to, to remember and think, think back on that. Uh, but it's not the, I mean, there's a few good uh, things to remember as well, Pamela. You had a couple of sort of right. sides to so, mention, right? So so the Opportunity rover roves on. It, it's actually currently planted on the side of a hill so that its solar panels can get as much sunlight as possible. But that little rover that was originally supposed to last only 90 days is still going nine years later, and we're hoping that it'll get a good wind blast to clean off its solar panels so that it can keep going and going and going. Um, what's kind of remarkable is I remember also the day it landed, that was a day that was colder in Boston than it was on Mars. And we're all thinking, can we be with the rovers? Um, and then it, it also is the anniversary of Voyager 2 going past Uranus. Uh, that was January 24, 1986. And what's kind of amazing is I know as a little kid, I followed the Voyager missions like someone would follow a celebrity. And the Challenger disaster completely wiped the Uranus flyby out of my mind. But looking back on it, that was a week that we learned of five new moons going around Uranus that we restudied 10, sorry, we learned about 10 new moons. We restudied five that we knew it existed. We got to find out that they have these amazing geologic features on them. The outer solar system is an amazing and interesting place. And Voyager just kept telling us more and more about it. That's cool. All right, so let's get on with the actual news this week. Uh, so, now, Ian, uh, you were going to inform us about the uh, the massive solar storms that are buffeting the, the Earth this week. Yeah, it's been a record-breaking week, really, for um, solar physicists, because only Tuesday um, the NOAA announced that this is the most intense period of solar storms, solar radiation storms, since 2003. Now, before we all start getting freaked out that, you know, the sun's kicking off all these flares and coronal mass ejections and creating all these wonderful um, aurora at uh, high latitudes, um, this is 2012, and it's not the end of the world, just to get this out of the way, this is a natural part of the solar cycle for this cycle. And we're currently in solar cycle 24, so when, when I referred to 2003, that was actually the previous cycle. And that was the, the famous um, Halloween flares that were very, very exciting back then. I was actually in soda research at the time. So um, that was a, a pretty big let, red letter day. But anyway, come to the most recent flares, um, a particularly angry part of the sun called an active region actually fired off a few fairly big flares. So they are N-class flares. Uh, one was actually just shy of a X-class flare, which is the most powerful kind of flare the sun can emit. And... So it happened on Friday last week, a um, Earth-directed um, coronal mass ejection, which is basically a bubble of plasma, 
was launched from the surface of the sun after one of these flaring events. Now it took a little bit longer than expected to reach Earth, but it did hit Earth and it hit in a very spectacular way. It basically interacted with our Earth's atmosphere, our Earth's uh, magnetosphere, which is our Earth's global magnetic field. And when the man magnetic field of the coronal mass ejection interacted with our, atmosphere, our, our magnetosphere, it generated a geomagnetic storm. And basically our magnetic field had a party and it, it put out the light show, um, the northern hemisphere at a high, a high latitude and the southern hemisphere at a high latitudes, both experienced really, really incredible auroral displays. And we actually managed to get a photographer from Norway. He was actually taking photos in the, near the Norwegian town of Tromsø. And he took some, some of the most incredible pictures of this auroral event. And this wasn't just confined to Norway. It was all around um, uh, high latitudes up in Alaska and some as far as I think a few uh, northern uh, American cities um, uh, got, uh, got a really good view of, uh, of the event. And basically this was just the first wave. This was only on Sunday and actually on Sunday on the surface of the sun again another coronal mass ejection was launched and that actually arrived on Tuesday. Um, it wasn't quite as spectacular as the first, but that uh, the, it still produced um, a, a geomagnetic storm, and so that really um, that really confirmed that this is the most acti active time for the sun since 2003. So every, a very exciting time for solar physicists. So every time that uh, that these big monster storms are are released, people always have to write these disclaimers in their articles about how you know don't worry, there's not going to be any damage, it's not going to kill all life on Earth. Um, what what are the actual implications of, of solar storms this powerful? And you know when would we want to worry? Well, it's all about preparedness, really. And I spoke with um, a NASA solar physicist actually um, yesterday, uh, Alex Young, and I actually worked with Alex Young, funnily enough, on the Discovery Channel documentary 2012 Apocalypse, and we discussed solar storms then. So obviously that's our connection. So it goes all about. Yeah, and so we're really good friends now. I mean, obviously, we're brought together through Doomsday, so what, what better time to, to make a friend? Um, so I, I discussed it with him, and he's very much into space weather. You know, the whole uh, the impact of the sun on the Earth is, is generally known as space weather. And prediction of space weather is very important, like predicting the path of a hurricane is very important because, you know, if you're in Florida, you like to have a couple of days' notice when you've got to, you know, board up your windows and perhaps even evacuate from, from coastal cities. So it's pretty much the same thing for the sun and uh, solar physicists, this is the main thrust of solar physics funding. In fact, I was funded for space weather purposes um, back in, in early 2000s. And although I was looking on the surface of the sun, I was working on coronal loops. For us to understand the mechanisms of these um, coronal loops on the surface of the sun is very important for the implications on Earth. Because if one of these things emitted by the sun, like a coronal mass ejection, it can take a few hours if it's going at one hell of a pace through interplanetary space, or it can take a few days. Now, if we get enough warning, we can alert uh, national power grid companies, for one, because when these um, coronal mass ejections hit the atmosphere, they can generate incredibly powerful currents through our atmosphere, and that induces currents on the ground, which can overload national power grids. So it's useful for the power companies to go, ah, you know, there's a solar storm coming, we'll turn down the juice a bit. So they will actually turn down the voltage supply going into that national power grid. Um, also another implication obviously is satellites. And in this case, when we were hit on the weekend on Sunday by this coronal mass ejection, this bubble of plasma actually compressed our magnetic field and exposed geo uh, sorry, uh, geosynchronous satellites, so like communication satellites orbiting a few thousand uh, kilometers above our heads, um, they were actually exposed to the solar wind. Usually they're protected by the, the force field of the magnetic field of the Earth, um, but this time they were exposed. So this is also an implication for um, communications companies. They want to power down their satellites or at least be aware that there's a solar storm coming in case the worst should happen. So did, did anybody get a chance to see this crop of solar storm, or, or um, sorry, aurora? I mean, we saw some crazy pictures and some videos, and I, I know, Phil, you've been posting a ton of them on Bad Astronomy. It's been, uh, it's been tough to keep up, actually. There were so many people posting pictures, mostly from Norway and Sweden, 
that it was uh, it was everything I could do to keep up, especially since I was preparing to leave town last night uh, uh, to give a talk. And in fact, you know, you know what? Um, I, I didn't see it because, of course, it was snowing in Boulder. That's that's kind of typical whenever we get these kind of events. And and Colorado is right at the limit, uh, more or less, of where you can see an aurora under normal circumstances. So we're just south of that. If I lived in Wyoming, I'd probably I'd probably be able to see some. I've actually never seen a big, strong auroral display. Uh, I've never seen a total solar eclipse either. Uh, it's it's frustrating and irritating. Um, yeah. yeah, no, neither have I. I've seen mid-range ones, and I haven't. I've seen partial solar eclipses, but never seen a total one. Yeah, it's Road it's trip. Uh, it's maddening. Road yeah. Trip. Road trip. <laughs> yeah, when I was actually living in, in Norway for five months back in 2002, of course that was the that was around so the solar maximum of the last solar cycle. So when I was living up there, I was actually within the aurora oval, and so I could see the aurora erupt overhead. And it's the one thing that took me by surprise was how dynamic it is. It's almost like um, curtains waving in the wind, and it snakes across the across the from horizon to horizon. It's a fantastic sight. If you ever get a chance to see it, you've got to see it. It's life changing. I, I had an amazing moment several years ago. I, I think this was the same set that had the Halloween flares um, back in what was that, 2004? 2003. And 2003. 2003. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd taken a whole group of students up to a friend's cabin in New Hampshire, and the students were rawr, arguing over how to run a program. It was, it was a very necessary argument, but nonetheless, we'd all gotten a little too intense, and the person who owns the cabin walked over to the whole group of us science, math, technology people, and said, um, you might want to look up. And there was this amazing aurora with green streaks shooting all the way up to zenith, and you could see the changing patterns, oh, and we'd man. all been completely oblivious and just stopped cold in the conversations and just sort of ended up sort of sitting there going, oh, for about 30 minutes until we realized we were cold, and then started a fire and sat there and went, oh, it was, you've got to see this. It's, it's, oh. trans it, yeah. it, it's like I remember that night. It was road a trip, all right. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Road trip. Uh, so, all right, well, we're going to move on. Uh, Alan, uh, you were going to tackle uh, talking about Newt Gingrich's recent announcement that, we, that he's going to help us build or help NASA build a moon base uh, by 2020. Yeah, yeah uh, this was uh, yesterday's uh, talk in Florida, and, of course, uh, space business is big business in Florida, and so uh, you have to kind of preach to the choir a little bit. And Newt was uh, really preaching. Uh, said that uh, we could get to the moon by 2020. He would he would uh, get an American moon colony up there uh, and would uh, put together competitions for uh, for uh, developing new rockets, uh, create a new series of X prizes using 10% of the NASA budget, which would come to 1.8 billion dollars, and perhaps have a 10 billion dollar prize for the for the first uh, commercial group to get to the moon. So uh, there's a lot of this in the air and uh, a, lot, a lot of talk about Newt Skywalker or, or uh, Speaker Moonbeam. And so I'm not sure whether this is the beginning or the end of the Gingrich uh, space program because uh, back in 2004 when President Bush came up with his uh, initiative, uh, that really turned into a point of ridicule, you know, that, that uh, President Bush wants to go to Mars and we should let him. And so we're seeing a lot of that with, uh, with Newt as well. But the issue is that it really could be doable under some circumstances, but it takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of uh, cojones to, to do that sort of thing. And uh, it's not clear whether this is the right environment for that. Interestingly, uh, there was an article in The New Yorker just a few days ago talking about uh, Obama's uh, journey uh, through the, the budget trials. And, and uh, one of the things that was mentioned in that article was how they had this inspirational space program that they were going to have to drop because of the problems with the budget and the problems with the economy. That points up one of the big problems. Another issue is safety. How safe is it? Uh, there was a report that came out just from just uh, yesterday from the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, 
expressing concern about the safety of uh, NASA's space commercialization effort. And, and you'll probably hear a little bit more about that as people continue to struggle over the soul of NASA. What, what should NASA be doing? Uh, Romney is supposed to come out with his own statement uh, later on this week in advance of the Florida primary uh, to talk about what he would do in space. But he has a more traditional view, let's have a commission, probably the 200th commission on what we should be doing with space policy uh, in the past 20 years, but uh, that is, at least for the next few days, that's going to be uh, one of the issues on the political agenda, and, and it may continue, but more likely it'll kind of go back into the box for uh, another couple years. But this isn't that out of character for Newt Gingrich. I mean, from what I understand, he's a huge space, or a big space fan, big science fan, and a, like a, like totally into dinosaurs. Right? And if he yeah. hadn't been a politician, he would have been a paleontologist. <laughs> well, I can't, yeah, that's true. I can't speak to, to the paleontology an angle of it, but he is the space geek candidate. And he's got uh, some of the space geeks on his, uh, on his team, apparently, who are advising him, some of these people that I know. And they're always uh, very gung-ho about uh, kind of pushing the space frontier. And so Newt has, has that uh, idea. In fact, uh, some years ago, he proposed an idea where if you get 13,000 Americans in moon colonies on the moon, then they could petition to uh, become the 51st state. And so we would have the state of moon uh, as the 51st star on the flag. So that, yeah. that just Can seems like it would that? break so many international regulations. I don't want to get too political here, but let's be careful. Uh, he may be very pro-space, but he's been equivocating a lot in this campaign about climate change and evolution. Yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily say he's pro-science. Uh, and, and uh, you know, when there are campaign promises being made, yeah. it may not necessarily ever even come within a glancing blow of happening, let alone being realistic at all. Alan mentioned uh, Bush's plan to go, to go to Mars and the moon. Um, that's, a, that's a really good point. That, one of the reasons that failed, there were a number of reasons that failed, but one of the reasons is that it's what we call an unfunded mandate. Right. A mandate yeah. is something you have to do, and unfunded means we're not going to give you any money to do it. So NASA has a limited budget. It's a finite amount of money. They can only do so much with it. If you then come in and say, and by the way, you're going to have to do something like, like this, like go to Mars, which is going to cost multiple billions of dollars, Where's that money going to come from? Well, we have to start raiding other projects to do it, and that's a great way of destroying an agency. There's a lot of infighting and, and, and people trying to, to grasp at dwindling resources. Right. The, the uh, difference here, at least fractionally, is that Gingrich has said, we can find the money by doing this, but that doesn't make his proposal any more realistic. Uh, I, when I hear stuff like that, all I think of is campaign promise. You know, I, I am personally a huge advocate for going back to the moon, for landing colonies there, practicing there before we go on to Mars so that we can learn how to do it. People ask me all the time, would you rather go to Mars or the moon? It's like, well, I want to do both, but one is significantly harder than the other. Going to, going to the moon is a way to learn how to go to Mars. Yeah. But, you know, even, even saying we're going to do this by 2020 is uh, a fantasy. The, we, could, we can certainly get to the moon by 2020. We could start things up, but uh, it, it would, I'm not sure it would be something that would be sustainable. It might just be another Apollo where the goal is we have a, we have a deadline. We've got to get there by then, and, main, and that, that sort of pushes aside the sustainability argument of being able to keep it up for a long period of time. For that, you need money, you need people, you need dedication, and you need politicians who can see past the four-year boundary. And I'm not sure any of those things are, are included in this project. I don't want to dismiss it, uh, but I'm just saying that, you know, it's a campaign promise. Uh, yeah, if you, yeah, if you want to know where Newt Gingrich's head is at when it comes to space exploration, you should read uh, Robert Heinlein's uh, book, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, and I, I think that, that will probably tell you what you need to know, that he comes from a school where if you just unleash the private enterprise, uh, they will figure out how to make money from the moon, and you know, if you have to do something about the Outer Space Treaty while you're doing it, well, that's just the way that frontiers are, are uh, settled. 
Uh, Ryan McGreevy in the comments uh, said that NASA should have a Kickstarter project for a moon base, which I think is a great idea. So we'll do a Kickstarter project, or NASA can do one for whatever, $10 billion. And then if it gets funded, then everyone can get a piece of moon dust or something, right? Yeah, what, one of the great sure points... <laughs> no, it's not legal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one, one of the great points I saw on Twitter yesterday was, sure, if you gave NASA over 4% of the entire U.S. budget to do what it wanted, we could do this in eight years. But mm -hmm. at the less than half a percent, at least I think that's what it is right now that they currently have, um, dreams like this mean no science. And while we have commercial space agencies who can go build bases, let's let NASA do the science, which isn't going to get commercially funded. And bearing in mind that Congress right now couldn't even agree on how to spell moon, I don't yeah. think yeah, something like this is politically viable. Yeah. All right, well, why don't we move on? So, Pamela, you've got a story this week about the role, the link between galaxy formation and right. the black holes inside them. And I guess we're always talking about this on Astronomy Cast. Which came first, the black holes or the galaxies? And, and really, it appears to have been both. Oh. Um, so th this is the ever-evolving story of, okay, why is it that when you look at the very early universe, you see massive galaxies that don't seem like they should have had enough time to form with massive amounts of stars and no star formation? Why did the star formation stop? How did they grow so fast? And what we're slowly learning is there's this picture of some galaxies formed by little things coming together and merging into bigger and bigger things. And in some cases, you just end up with everything going thwomp and forming a giant system all at once. And in these systems that formed all at once, you end up with massive amounts of star formation because all of these colliding and merging um, pockets of gas and dust are collapsing into stars. Now, at the same time, there is turbulence through the spiraling system, and this turbulence is able to help drive material into a central supermassive black hole. Now, the thing about driving material into black holes is it gets really hot and really dense, and really hot, dense material, we call that a star. Now, the accretion disk, it isn't really a star, but in a lot of ways, it behaves like a star in terms of giving off so much light that that light actually is able to push on the other material trying to fall in. So you have material trying to fall into the central supermassive black hole. It's forming a hot disk, and the stuff that's already in the disk is going, OK, I'm going to press everything trying to fall in out with light. And not only does it press it out from falling in with the light, but it keeps pushing and pushing and pushing, clearing out the entire inner region of a galaxy. This is two, eff two effects. One it stops star formation because all of the gas and dust that was involved in star formation, it, it gets pushed out of the way or it falls into the black hole. Either way, it's not available to make stars. The other effect that it has is that black hole finishes eating the stuff that produced the light and then shuts off because all the stuff that would have fed it in the future, the stuff that got into the disk first has pushed out of the way with light. So what's amazing is you can use light, just the pressure of light, to completely clear out the inside of some of the most massive galaxies forming in the early universe. Now, these are all ideas that people have been percolating around for several years. But with the Apex Telescope, the um, Atacama Pathfinder experiment, it's a 12-meter radio dish that works in millimeter wavelengths of light, which, which Nicole may consider a little too short to truly be radio. Um, it's this, a dish. It's okay. It's a dish. Uh, so this particular dish out in, Atacom, in the Atacama Desert, it was able to look back at giant galaxies 10 billion light years back and see this happening. They were able to see the massive starburst. They were able to combine data from multiple other telescopes and put the pieces together to see there are active, gal there are active nuclei in the centers of these galaxies. By putting all these pieces together observationally, they were able to say, yes, the theory that we've been working on for the past couple of years, that matches reality. And it's always good when theory and reality match one another. That is awesome. All right, well, then that's it. We just we put that to to bed now for all future episodes of Astronomy <laughs> Cast, which is that it's both. Well, you didn't mention magnetic fields, so there's always that. <laughs> or dust. Plenty of stories dust. left there. Yeah. Right, right. Um, Did you have a lot of dust that early? You, well, it, so, it, yeah, it, it depends on how many supernova have gone off. Supernova yeah, started yeah. going off pretty fast in these sectors. That's true, yeah. 
All right, so for our last story, we're going to go back to Alan, and we're going to talk about sort of probably our final look at the uh, doomed Phobos Grunt mission, which uh, came back to Earth. And I guess, Alan, now we have some more information about where it came back to Earth? Well, uh, the European Space Agency was the entity that was kind of the final arbiter. They were putting together uh, this group called the uh, IADC, which was trying to determine exactly where Phobos Grunt went down. It, it was their exercise to, to do this. And uh, if you'll remember from our previous episode, uh, there was talk about how this came down in the Pacific. Uh, that's what the Russians said. They said it pretty quickly, and people didn't really trust it all that much because the Russians have done this before. They've said, oh, there's no harm from that satellite that went down, and all of a sudden there's radioactive debris spread across northern Canada. So uh, in this case, uh, there was a, it took a long time to put together the, uh, the final answer for where Phobos Grunt came down, and the final answer was the same as the first answer, basically, that it came down in the South Pacific, west of Chile. But there is a chance that, that some of the debris from the crash uh, may have uh, landed on South America. We will probably never know uh, unless uh, somebody comes up with a fuel tank somewhere at some point. Uh, so we can just kind of put this episode to bed, but there was a lot of angst over uh, what people knew and how, how did they know it and when did they know it. Uh, and uh, ESA uh, basically said, well, this is not the way things should be run. We should be a little more nimble about figuring this out, and, and we'll, we'll try to do that in the future. It really got wrapped up in the politics between the U.S. Strategic Command and the Russians and, and the suspicions that people had that uh, they weren't getting the full truth. And, and so uh, I think this is just going to fade into the background, but it, it really is going to be something that people are going to have to watch for future uncontrolled reentries uh, to try to have a system uh, where they can figure out more quickly and in a more transparent manner how these things come down and where they come down. Do you think there's some kind of backlash coming for the space agencies to have a better control over how their spacecraft re-enter? I mean, I know that when Mir re-entered, they actually, you know, I'm trying to remember, or was, was it Mir that they actually boosted it down to make sure they knew where it was going to, where it was going to crash? They, yeah, they, they forced uh, it down, right? That was a controlled re-entry. They, they had it come down over the Pacific. With uh, Phobos Grunt, because they couldn't communicate with the spacecraft all that well, that it was uncontrolled. And it just so happened that it apparently worked out uh, for the best. And, and uh, it, it just rubbed a particular part of the space community, these satellite watchers, the wrong way, that they felt they weren't getting the full information. And so you're going to have uh, a, a segment of the, uh, the amateur satellite watching uh, community that is going to be on its guard, and, and they, they're kind of still bristling over how this turned out. So uh, in the grand scheme of things, it might not be a huge deal, but uh, for the insiders, I, I think that there are some raw feelings that still need to be assuaged. No, but I just think with the with the UR's re-entry that we talked yeah. about, <clears throat> um, that caused a lot of anxiety in Phobos Grunt as well, just in general, and I think it gives sort of overall space exploration and space launches a bit of a negative view for people when they, when they sort of don't understand st their statistical chance of getting hit, and they, you know, start to think that they have a 1 in 3,000 chance of being hit by a spacecraft when, when you know, mm -hmm. that's not the true statistics. So I'm just wondering if there's going to be any, any plans by the space agents to be more careful or maybe to even put in some kind of, you know, some kind of detonation, some kind of independent, you know, detonation device where if your spacecraft goes off, you know, this thing could detect that it's not where it's supposed to be and just blow up the satellite, you know. In the long term, uh, you could have uh, satellite tugs that uh, go up there and kind of manage how, how things are done. But I think it's an educational effort. I think the URs was the first one. There was a lot of angst about that. Rosat was the second example, and there was less angst about that. I think there's even less angst about Phobos Grunt. And so I think people are getting used to it, just as they're getting used to dealing with thinking about asteroid threats. So, I don't right, know, maybe, just maybe Phil, wait. yeah. <laughs> just, just you wait. When Hubble comes down, right, uh, right. Hubble has no control on it right now. And there, when, when uh, uh, a few years ago, there, there was talk of, of launching some sort of device to be able to either bring it down or push it up to a safe orbit. And uh, it's, a, it's a big machine, and a, a lot of it is, is hollow. It's a telescope, and it'll burn up. But it's got an eight-meter, or excuse me, a, a two-and-a-half-meter mirror, an eight-foot mirror. 
and that's a big solid chunk of, of glass. There is no way that's going to burn up in reentry. That's going to hit. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, you know, the odds of it being over water are very high. The odds of it hitting somebody are very low. But uh, it's a beloved satellite. This isn't some satellite where everybody's going to go, what? What is that? You are. What is that thing? No, this is Hubble. Everybody's heard of Hubble. And if this thing comes down, coupled with the fact that it's got big chunks of things that are going to come down intact, that's going to be on everybody's mind when it happens. I don't know when that's going to be. That might not be for 20 years. But, but between that, now and then, we're going to have to figure it out. Mm-hmm. The idea of a, of a satellite tug, something like that, is interesting. I'm not sure how you do that logistically, maybe with an actually, ion drive. But, and, and, uh, right. Actually, during the last servicing mission, that's one of the things that the spacewalkers did, is that they installed an apparatus that could be used to grapple Hubble, Hubble and right. bring it down in a controlled manner. So, I mean, but that's, there's that's a little a, bit crossing fingers here. Yeah, yeah, that's like a, it's a Hail <laughs> we'll Mary. We'll figure it out. We're going to put this up in case we develop these things later, and that's great. Um, but this is something that uh, the space agencies and the private companies, too, are going to have to worry about sooner rather than later, even if it just means installing, you know, a little black box that, that lets us know exactly where the satellite is. That might even be a nice first step. Uh, but having something where we can control the reentry of these things or or boost them up to a safe orbit uh, is is something that I think they're going to be they're going to have to be dealing with very soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think we're done the uh, the sort of scheduled portion of our broadcast, and I thought I would now open it up to the questions in the uh, in the chat. So again, if you're watching this live on Google Plus, there sh- you should be seeing about I don't know how many there are right now. I guess about uh, 50 comments on this conversation. So if you want to ask a a question to us, you can just post it there. Uh, you can also post questions onto Twitter with the uh, hashtag, was it CQX? Was that right, Pamela? Yeah. So. She's probably muted. Um, Sorry, pound CQX, pound hangout. Right. So pound CQX, pound hangout, and you can ask a question there if you're watching this on cosmoquest.org, um, and we'll be glad to ask questions until, uh, you know, probably another 15, 20 minutes. So, so and, and also, I think, uh, I think everyone here deserves a, uh, you know, a congratulations for very careful typing control and, uh, and back, keeping their backgrounds nice and clean and tidy. So, you know, we're, we're, we're raising the professionalism of this whole event uh, in bits and pieces. So, so thank you to everybody. I think you did a great job. Um, and so, bed. again, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you made your bed. Um, okay, so I'm going to look through uh, and see if anyone has a, has a question. Um, oh, arsenic life. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I miss Phil. Oh, Phil, you should have just jumped in. Why didn't you get to? Oh, I figured I'd already gathered on enough. So had you already okay. know? Right. So sorry. I got. I got one. We have one last news topic, which was. Which was Phil. You're going to talk about the the what the unarsenicking, the unlifening of that uh, of that lake. Uh, arsenic and old news. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for anybody old enough to remember that movie, Arsenic and Old Lace. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. <laughs> um, okay. <sighs> Uh, late in 2010, uh, a group of uh, microbiologists, biochemists, came out with the news, uh, in a huge press release uh, sponsored by NASA, that a lake in California called Mono Lake had bacteria that could not only survive in an, in an environment that had a lot of arsenic, they were actually using the arsenic in their biochemistry. Now, this is huge news. This lake is incredibly toxic. It's, got, it, it's, uh, it's uh, hugely basic. That's the opposite of acidic. Um, it's, it's basically uh, the same sort of uh, pH levels that, that commercial antacids have. So this is a, a very toxic lake, and it also has huge levels of arsenic. But there are these bacteria that live in there. And so this group studied this, and what they found is that uh, the, the arsenic in that lake was being used by this bacteria. Now, if you were to take arsenic, it would kill you. What it does is uh, it replaces the phosphorus in your body. If phosphorus and arsenic have a similar chemical uh, they have similar character, uh, characteristics chemically, and uh, phosphorus is the is basically the backbone of DNA. So it's it, your your DNA is a spiral sort of a helix, and that's built on a phosphorus backbone. Not only that, but phosphorus is used in uh, some fairly sophisticated chemicals in your cells to transport and store energy. So if you remove that phosphorus in the DNA and in these molecules and replace it with arsenic, they fall apart. And so your, your cells basically cannot survive, and it, it's just, it kills you. And it, that's true for almost every 
uh, form of life based on, or it's true for every form of life based on, on carbon and DNA. So to find bacteria that seem to not only survive arsenic, but to have incorporated it into their biochemistry is huge news, especially if you're looking for life on other planets. It opens up a whole new field of, of biology. So there was a big, uh, big to-do. NASA had a press conference. Almost immediately, uh, the results of this came under attack. And a lot of people were saying, look, this science is terrible. Uh, this, this, was, this was a poorly done research uh, uh, project and all that kind of stuff. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of sniping going on, in fact. Well, uh, one researcher named Rosie Redfield was very public about this and said, I don't think they did their work very well, and I'm going to redo it publicly and report progress on my blog. And what happened was this week, uh, she basically announced her results, and her results are that she, she replicated what the original group did and found completely the opposite results. They did not see the arsenic being taken up into the uh, DNA of this bacteria, and therefore whatever the first group said was wrong. This is really interesting. The science of this, of course, is really important. If there is a new way of life to survive, again, that opens up a new branch of biochemistry and microbiology. That's very important. But it's also important in the way science is now being done. Uh, a lot of the times these people, they, they sit in their lab, they get their grants, they do their work, they announce it through the peer review process, and maybe have a press conference, they publish it in a, in a, in a paper or something like that. To actually do this openly, to blog about your results. And this, you know, Rosie Redfield is not some you know, random blogger. She's a university uh, researcher in Canada, and she's got the cred, right? So this is a fascinating uh, example of the public display of science that's going on now. Now, of course, uh, for, for the, for the follow-on here, the first group that announced the results in the first place is saying, well, uh, Dr. Redfield's results have not been peer-reviewed yet. We haven't been able to analyze how they've done it exactly, so we're going to reserve comment, which is, you know, the correct thing to do. Uh, but we'll see what happens now because those results are going to go through the peer review process. They are going to try to get them published in a journal, and we'll see what happens. Uh, this is not over yet. Uh, Dr. Redfield has said, you know, I've shown what I need to show. I'm done. And I'm thinking, yeah, no, you haven't because there are going to be people attacking you now. So uh, we'll have to see how this goes. This isn't and done. Peer review. Yeah, peer Go review ahead. doesn't mean it's if, – if it passes peer review, that doesn't mean that it's correct. And I think yes. we've all seen that tons of times in the journals um, and through press releases that come out. Just because it's been through peer review, that means, uh, you know, some other scientist has looked over it and thinks this is good science, this was, um, you know, done in a certain manner that is correct, um, but that doesn't mean it's right. Uh, studies and are published that contradict each other all the time. And, and in some cases, all because something didn't make it through peer review doesn't mean it is wrong. It simply right. means it was badly written, or they had a highly political referee who went, no, I don't like you personally. <laughs> now, obviously, the established scientific community is going to absolutely hate this method of doing science, but, you know, some of you here are actual scientists. Um, what do you think about this? What do you think about this as a way for, for science to get done? I mean, possibly even eventually replacing the peer review process. Science by viable. press release? Well, no, science, really? science by blogging, science by public, yeah. by transparency, by, by sort of an open, you know, a person posts the results and somebody else questions the results and, and science moves forward. I mean, at the end of the day, nature is the final arbiter, so, right. you know. Not the journal, the, 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 the mother nature. No, no, yeah, nature. nature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mother nature, yes. The, yeah, yeah, this nature. is kind of... This is kind of what happened with those faster than light speed neutrinos. The uh, uh, LHC scientists went on the record before they published anything. They said they've got these very this fascinating results. Um, they're going to publish, but ultimately, what does the world think about this result, this intriguing result that we're measuring neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light? What do you think, world? Of course, that caused a, a maelstrom of... Um, you know, bad media, good media, fascinated media, um, public suddenly became aware of what a neutrino was. So I, th I think it's a pretty, pretty good way of doing it. But then again, you can't really, I don't think you can do science that way. But there, I think it um, brings more, br more brains to the table. There, there's two subtly different scenarios. One is you have a result, you're not entirely sure it's right, or you need confirmation. 
and you put out a, a call saying, dear community, please confirm this result. This is basically what the supernova community does. Someone says, I think I found a supernova. Can someone else on the planet confirm this? I think I found an outburst of a cataclysmic variable. Can someone else on the planet confirm this? But the other side of that coin is where you go, I have a result. It isn't confirmed yet. Dear press, please promote this so that I will get tenure. I, they don't usually say the second half of that, but it's implied. Um, the latter case, where you're going to the press to get attention for your research, that's not how you should do it. Where you say to the community in a forum that the media is likely to latch on to, um, simply because we're all always looking for the next big story. I have a result. It's not confirmed. Can anyone else out there confirm this? That's how you do science. I think Openly. Yeah, that already happens. Yeah. Not in, in, the, in where the media can see it. That already happens on email lists and in the background. Right. And, and so we need to be careful as members of the press to always have the right caveats to be able to say group X has an unconfirmed result they're seeking community confirmation of the result versus group X has this amazing result that I'm going to tell you all about and that's yes. our job yeah and specifically to these cases Ian brings up a good point the uh, the neutrino uh, researchers at the facilities in uh, in Europe they were saying and, and, I, and I read, you know, I, I watched the colloquium they had and I read their paper. They said, look, we've got this crazy result and everything we do seems to check out. Can somebody figure out what's going on here? And everybody jumped in and said, well, it's probably in your timing. You know, yeah. their, their experiment looks fine, but how they were timing the neutrinos may be the problem. Now, you know, what their motivation was for making this press release, hard to say. It, it, I can see where they can say, look, we've got this crazy result. We want to spread this as far and wide as the, in the scientific community as possible. <clears throat> Pardon me. But on the other hand, <coughs> live TV, right? Well, <laughs> oh, I'm choking. The neutrino got me. <laughs> it's it's from the stars. <laughs> Those arsenic neutrinos. Uh, but in, in this case, uh, um, you know, the scientific community came in and, and did something, but, but maybe they wanted to get ahead of the press. They knew that if they released this out into the scientific wild, the press would get a hold of it, and faster than light travel is very sexy. So maybe they just decided to get ahead of it. It's hard to say. And Europeans do, uh, especially uh, on the main continent, they do media and press very differently than we do here in the United States. Uh, as far as the arsenic thing, you know, the the it wasn't quite like that. It wasn't like we have this crazy result that we want to send out into the scientific wild and let other scientists comment. That was a NASA press release that came out and said we found arsenic life. Boom. And, and I'll note that I wrote about that straight. I figured NASA's releasing this. They've gone through the process. They've got everybody checking, and it turns out that wasn't really the case. The scientific community really came out against this arsenic life thing. And so the, the, two, uh, the two different uh, stories have interesting parallels and interesting contrasts, and I think that might be where the, the, the next step is going to be. Yes, this is going to affect how the scientific process is going, as you mentioned, Fraser. What is this going to mean in the future, especially with the, uh, uh, the interwebs out there, but also um, uh, how, uh, how people are going to talk about how they do their science. That's going to be interesting as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I can see that, you know, as we enter a period of disruption where there's new ways and, and as the media does jump on these big stories, that people are going to are going to react and say, no, 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 we shouldn't get the word out. But I think those of us who've been reporting on Space News have seen, like, for example, with asteroid, you know, close, close passes of asteroids, or, you know, the fact that some asteroid is, is, has been estimated to hit us in 42 years, the first time that happens, everybody panics. Now, you know, we barely even, you know, go into it. And so it just gets to be a lesser and lesser deal. And I think that over time, we'll all figure out the appropriate ways to put this all in perspective and hopefully... Um, the media will do a better job of being able to put things into perspective. The scientists will be able to know which things they should say to the media and when and to each other and on which channels. And I think the public will, will just ignore it the way they always do. It's just a matter of getting them to the point that they, you know, that they don't panic about it. So, so let, me, let, me, uh, let me crack into some questions now. Well, thanks, Phil. Sorry we, we forgot about you. I can't believe we forgot about Phil. That's okay. I just um, need to make more noise, clearly. <laughs> me, me, me. My job. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> um, no, that's true. 
Now, Jamie Rich asked, uh, sort of back to the Phobos Grunt conversation, what would happen when the ISS needs to come down? Uh, well, uh, they had a, that's been a controversy in the past, is that uh, NASA has to have a plan for disposing of the ISS, and so uh, when there was talk about how it, they were going to have to cut it loose somewhere in the 2016 to 2020 time frame, uh, they came up with this study, and a lot of uh, the press interpreted that as saying, oh, NASA is going to get rid of the space station. Well, no, you just need to have a plan to get rid of it when the time comes, and so that's, that's what they're doing doing is working on the disposal plan. Uh, right now, they're going to continue operations until at least 2020, and it's probably going to be up there until 2030, the way that these things work. But uh, that is going to have to be a very controlled uh, re-entry. Uh, I don't know what the details are. Maybe somebody else does, but I don't think that they can take this thing apart. So they just have to steer it very carefully uh, into the Pacific when, when the time comes. But maybe other people have more information about that. Um, on the on the Twitters, uh, Jamers3294 uh, actually asked uh, Pamela, uh, so what is the purpose of peer review if it doesn't determine good science? And, and I was just trying desperately to answer that in 140 characters and failing <laughs> miserably. Um, <laughs> so, so the problem is, in an ideal world, peer review is done by Vulcans who write very good constructive criticism. And when you get back your referee comments from the paper you have just written, you look at them and you're like, oh, wow, I should have mentioned all of these things. Yes, I did make this mistake. And as a result of reading through these referees' comments, you realize either what you did really shouldn't be published because you screwed up, or you get feedback that allows you to improve your paper to the point that you are doing much better science as mm -hmm. a result. Now, the problem is human beings aren't Vulcans. And so occasionally you'll get the referee's comments that I, I had a paper reviewed that the comments were so nasty that my student who got the comments went and hid for a week whether, rather than letting me share the comments. And, and sometimes you get comments that are just plain wrong. I had a referee say that forums are not asynchronous communications places. I'm not sure what they meant, but I know that forums are asynchronous and are used for communications. Um, so sometimes you just get these things that are crazy and wrong and it makes you question the validity of what's going on and suspect underlying politics, suspect someone should have eaten breakfast. And, and all of these things add up to a broken system, not because the system is wrong per se, but because the system expects human beings to act in ideal ways that we don't always act in. And so as long as there's people out there with an agenda, as long as there's people out there in a bad mood, as long as there's people out there under-caffeinated, peer <laughs> review is going to produce bad referee reports and is going to allow bad papers to get published and is going to cause good researchers to get frustrated and sometimes cause students to get frustrated and leave the field. I mean, I think we always have the, the sort of balancing reality of reality. And so <laughs> yeah. it will always be pushing us back towards the, the truth, we hope. Yeah. As, long as, as long as scientists are still, you know, are going to be seeking the truth, you know, the different methods, whichever ends up giving us the best results, eventually is the one that's going to be adopted by science. And I think that making things transparent is, is always a good thing. Now, okay, we've got another question here. So this kit comes from Adrian Link Universe. Really? Is that your last name? <laughs> um, would it be possible to reveal the presence of huge aurora on exoplanets in the near future? Maybe hot Jupiters near the star. Ian, what do you think? Do you think we could view auroras on extrasolar planets? Yeah, I actually wrote an article about this probably a year ago, and I can't remember what the conclusions were, but I believe um, because aurora, when they impact, especially particularly violent aurora, um, especially on a hot Jupiter that orbits a few days around its star because it's just going to be fed by plasma all the time from its star. It generates not only light, and it would be debatable whether we'd have a sensitive enough telescope to actually see the auroral light, but it depends on how bright that light's going to be. Um, and they're doing amazing things with exoplanetary studies, so I won't take it away from... Um, it's not out of the realms of possibility. But I believe um, it generates um, radio... Uh, transmissions when 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 an aurora is raining overhead, um, it does actually emit other frequencies as well, and not just light. It actually produces radio waves, and so there is this. Um, I believe the the conclusions of this paper were that 
it's possible if you can find out what kind of frequency modulation these um, these aurora will um, transmit at. But you'd have to have a very very sensitive radio telescope. I for that. Yeah, but I think that's that's something that's square kilometer array, so 2020, 2030 time frame. We may yeah. have that telescope that has that sensitivity, but I think that's one of their goals. It'd be well cool though, screaming exoplanets. Yeah. All right. Listening can, can, you, can you do it in the X-ray or gamma ray? Because with aurora, you do get both X-ray and gamma ray, and if you have a nice quiet star that itself doesn't give off any high energy particles, and you detect even a few photons of these high energy in a system that you know has exoplanets, can you use, you'll never be able to resolve it, but could you link the two together to say that perhaps this is auroral activity being detected? I was wondering about that. I mean, you've, you've got, in general, won't the, would, would the star have to be magnetically active to be able to generate strong aurorae on these exoplanets? And if that's the case, they're both generating the same kind of light. And if that's true, or the same type of energy, if that's true, the sun, the star, is always going to be brighter than the planet. Yeah, the I'm trick a... is to find where the planet's giving off light, mm -hmm. where the star isn't, yeah. so that it, it pops out. And I'm not, I don't know. It's an interesting yeah, I'd, I'd argue the same as Phil. I mean, it, to have a quiet star that's um, generating a fierce enough aurora on its, on its orbiting exoplanet, um, I don't think you, you'd be Well, I'm thinking quiet, quiet in the gamma rays. Yeah. So so yeah, I mean, if you if you have a, um, I don't know, I, I suppose it, it's hard. I mean, I, I'm I'm still blown away that we're looking for um, signatures of exomoons orbiting exoplanets. So I'm sure that if we can detect a, a, a small, a large moon orbiting a distant exoplanet just through its motion across the across the disk of its star, I'd argue that yeah, I'm I'm sure that if we could. Um, find the typical frequencies that these, uh, perhaps in X-ray or gamma ray or even in a radio, I'm sure we detect it. Um, but uh, but as, as, as Nicole said, you probably need a very big array for that. I just thought of a way. <laughs> I'm going to write this down and publish it. There you uh, go. Yeah, I'm not going to say that. Share us. Open science. Come on. Yeah, yeah, open science. You can imagine if you have a, a cool red dwarf that uh, is the most common star in the sky that's orbited by one of these giant planets. Cool red dwarfs, uh, when they're magnetically active, can generate bursts of ultraviolet light. We've seen this in, in, in some of them. But you kind of get that with, a, with flare activity. You get a burst of ultraviolet light. So if you have a star that gives off a flare, that takes some time to get to the planet where the planet becomes active, just like the flare this week. The sun flared. It took a day for that to get to the Earth. So if you watch a star and you see a flare on it, a big jump in, say, ultraviolet light, uh, the exoplanet might respond sometime later. You keep watching it over and over again, and every time it does this, if you see big flare, little flare, and the same interval between them all the time, I'm just I'm, I'm spitballing here. That might, you might say, oh, that's a flaring star, and then the planet responding. Now, of course, the problem is the stars are constantly magnetically mm -hmm. active. They're blowing off flares all the time. That and might be Jupiter's hard. A lot but closer, so right, but this is time. something you could do with something other than a hot Jupiter. So mm -hmm. here, yeah. it, you can imagine having a, a Jupiter with the eight-minute delay that we have here on Earth or further out, and just as we've been able to right. detect the high-energy light from Jupiter and Saturn from the auroral um, activity yeah. on those two planets, we may not be able to detect the planet until Kepler finds the sucker, but we might be able to see this consistently lagging. Um, now, the thing was, it, it wouldn't actually be consistent. It would be a lag that varies with the, with the combined distance from the sun to the planet to us. So you can imagine this separation is constant, <laughs> but... True. <laughs> yeah, it's on the far side of the star versus the nearest. Awesome. Yeah. It, it would also depend on, on the speed. It would depend on the speed of the wave of particles as well. I mean, this last one took a day to get here. Sometimes they yeah. take four days. Sometimes right. they take hours. So I, I'm thinking, you know, the, in in practice, this would be probably almost impossible. But it would be. It, 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 but in theory, it's an interesting idea, and I, I certainly don't know enough about this to say anything more. I'm so going to do a search on uh, archive.org for plate at all, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> detecting exoplanet auroras. <laughs> so we've got about uh, we've got about like just a couple more minutes. So if anybody um, has any last questions, 
we'll take a crack at them. Um, <coughs> just a, just a, oh, go ahead, Pamela. And I was just going to say, if anyone wants the software that generates the page that we have on CosmoQuest.org slash Hangouts, that's been made available. And you can get all the links and all the documentation off of, uh, go to CosmoQuest.org slash blog. And we, we've blogged about it. And so if you're another person doing Google Hangouts out there, you can recreate what we did and tie this into your own accounts. Yeah, the, the important thing that we've got going now is, is we've got the CosmoQuest.org slash Hangouts um, website. And so if you go to that to CosmoQuest.org slash Hangouts, then you can just wait on that page, and then when the actual show begins, then it just automatically loads up into that page, which is great because a lot of people have been, been missing when the show starts. They have trouble sort of finding where it's coming. And then also, this pulls together all of the comments from both Twitter and uh, from Google+. So it's a pretty cool way to be able to watch the show um, and then be able to see sort of a countdown of when it's going to happen again next time. And so that's the place that we're going to be trying to put all of these space events that we're, that we're doing. Uh, and I think we're going to build a mailing list as well, probably yeah. starting this week. And so you can give us your email address, and then we'll send you an announcement when the show is about to start. And that way you've got another reminder to, to sort of blow off work and, and watch <laughs> us. So um, cool. All right. Well, let's see if there's any last questions. And if not, I think we can wrap this up. And we're just going to keep on doing open science, open source. Cool. Um, great. Okay. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up then. So, so thanks again to to everybody that got involved. Uh, thanks to the to the team of uh, of space journalists for joining us again this week, and thanks to everybody who watched, and thanks to Google Plus for giving us the infrastructure to be able to even do this. So, yeah. so thanks again to everybody. Thanks, thanks, thanks. All right. We'll see you all next week. Uh, same bat cha- Same bat time. Same bat channel. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.